Hi, this is Bob Scully, and welcome to another edition of The World Show, Entrepreneurs of the Fiera Series. There was a show when I was a kid on TV. After school, I would run home because I didn't want to miss it. It was called The Friendly Giant. You may know it. It was on both sides of the border, and it had this huge, hulking actor who played the friendly giant, and he would hold the house in his hands. And you felt so safe because he was a kind man. He was powerful. He could protect you, but he was sweet as can be. And you're going to meet the friendly giant this week, Ron DeRico, who has founded a major security company, Impact Security. He's no stranger to drama, obviously, in that business. You get plenty of it, but he never loses his cool and he never loses his human warmth. This man was once homeless. And he told me uh, after the interview, you know, to practice the craft of security, maybe it helps to have known insecurity. He did. And he disguised that from his parents, not to worry them, not to hurt their feelings. And he got out of hopelessness and eventually found his way into the security business where his father and his mother had both worked in different capacities. And he slowly, very determinedly, brick by brick, built a fantastic company and never exhibiting some of the cliche characteristics that we associate with that business. He is not rough and ready. He is the friendly giant. Here's Ron DeRico. Ron Rico, we're going to talk about impact today and, and the company you've built because it's quite an impressive achievement entrepreneurially. But first, I cannot not begin with something that just jumped off the page when I read it. You, who are in security, one might call that a very straight-laced conservative business, you were once a homeless person. That is correct. How come? My mother and father, uh, they moved in uh, 1988 to 89 to Toronto and uh, the fear of leaving Winnipeg to go to a bigger city terrified me and I was at a very uh, vulnerable age I was uh, 17 going on 18 and uh, I was terrified to uh, to go in that uh, direction I didn't think it would agree well with me I chose to stay behind and uh, basically had to find my own way uh, my mother and father by no means uh, neglected myself but I, uh, I basically lived on the, the mercy of other people from a couch to a basement to a room, uh, from a hotel to whatever I could find. Um, not homeless as in on the streets uh, in a cardboard box, but not having a residence uh, to call your own was very distressing and uh, giving an appearance that everything was fine when it wasn't. Um, I certainly wish they had uh, shelters out there to help a guy out back then like they do now. And it's become quite dangerous to be homeless. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, to working, uh, I was working full time and going to school. It was very, uh, it was very tiring, but uh, anything to, uh, to put a roof over my head and to get to the next step in life was, uh, was my focal point. But if, if I read the research correctly, your father was in the security business himself. Your mother was in loss prevention, I believe, at, at Woolco. What in the world did they think their son was up to? I'm surprised they didn't come back and grab you by the scruff. Well, I, I kept a lot of things uh, quiet and I kept to myself. I wasn't proud of my uh, personal situation, so I kept it very discreet. And uh, I knew that it wasn't going to be permanent. I was just going to be uh, focusing on getting ahead and... Uh, I made a promise that I would uh, come back and, and revisit my situation and remember that going forward to help other people in my situation when the chance I was able to do so. Which you've done. You, you've contributed to many causes, I've noticed. Thank you. Yes. Very passionate about that. For instance, uh, uh, one day I turned on the news on CBC. You're based in Winnipeg, Manitoba. It's a big city. It's the capital of the province of Manitoba. But they were doing a story on a small town in southern Manitoba where a Jamaican lady had opened a restaurant. And I guess the people there in that town had never met a black person. So they didn't go to her restaurant. They were snubbing her, hurting her feelings. Uh, and it was quite a sad story. But it was a one-day story. I didn't hear about it anymore until in the research I read that you also probably saw the story and you went in there to help her. I didn't think it was right. Um, she had a uh, beautiful heart. She was a Theo, Theo Morris, beautiful heart, uh, beautiful person. Um, I felt her pain. I knew that she was going against uh, the grain and uh, I asked Milt Stiegel, a very good friend of myself, to come in and uh, give me a hand and let's turn this town on the ear and bring awareness to her situation. 
And to go back before uh, your homeless uh, period, the homeless episode, um, you, like many future entrepreneurs, wanted a paper route as a boy. Uh, you wanted to, to deliver the paper, and there were two dailies in Winnipeg, and you ended up delivering both. You were that gung-ho. And, and as an entrepreneur, I've, I've often wondered if you had it in the blood to be in security because your father was in security, your mother was a store investigator. Did you feel destined to go in that direction? You know what, I, uh, I felt it. I, I always felt it when we sat at the table. Back in the days, we didn't have Google. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have social media, outlets, tablets, iPods, computers. You actually had to talk to each other. And the four of us would sit at the table, my father, my mother, my brother Tony, and myself. And we would all talk about each other's day. And I would hang on every word my father talked about his work in uh, security, investigating claims, fraudulent claims, uh, insurance claims. Uh, my mother would tell us uh, great stories. Uh, I could imagine the stories as she was speaking about how she would arrest people and what they stole and what would happen when she made the arrest. My brother and myself didn't have those fascinating stories to share, so we just shut up and we listened to the stories. And they were very entertaining, and when I, you know, it just always stuck to me. It was very entertaining. And, and in her case, it must have been occasionally dangerous, actually, to be uh, running after shoplifters who might have been bigger than her. I've seen my mother come home with some bruises. I've seen her come home uh, scratched up a few times, and it wasn't pretty. But, you know, she always managed to look after us and give us a good roof over our head. And one of the um, uh, perennial questions on, the, on this series, of course, is the start of a business. That's the toughest part. Um, it's lonely. It's, uh, it's hard. Uh, you got to get that first client, make that first sale. Usually the answer I get is there was rejection. People get over that and they keep going. But in your case, I read in the research on your first day, November 1, 1999, you went cold calling and you made a quarter million bucks on the first day. That is correct. That, that's unbelievable. <laughs> I don't know how to fail. <laughs> and who was this? Was this one client or is it, what, is it a bunch? This was a few uh, of clients that I, over the years, I had made some uh, relations with who encouraged me strongly to get into business for myself. And uh, I was working for other companies and other uh, uh, industry uh, leaders in security and I ventured on my own and I had encouragement from these people and finally I took the call and I said, look, I'm going to do this. It was my daughter was, uh, was born and I wanted to do something to, to provide a better life for us and uh, my family. And, uh, and it was easy, uh, just picked up the phone and I just had to talk and they knew from my background that I would give them that service. And, and they obviously they liked you a lot already. I mean, they left another supplier to go with you. Absolutely. And it was a great relationship that we built uh, successfully upon. Another hurdle that uh, entrepreneurs face at the, at the outset, of course, is the initial capital, the initial um, uh, seed money to, to get going because banks are very cold to startups, to say the least. Um, so you borrowed from your father. Uh, I'll let you tell the story. He, you offered him interest on it, but he didn't want it. What happened exactly? Well, my father was, uh, he was a good man. He, um, he wanted the best for myself and my brother, Tony. And he, I never asked him for anything in life. I always did everything myself. I never wanted to be one to, to beg, borrow, or steal. And I asked him for a small business loan because I was, the company was growing and the banks wouldn't touch me. Um, they, they looked at me like I was crazy. I might as well walked in and asked for Mercedes. Um, <laughs> I just wanted, you know, money to make payroll. And I knew a payroll was coming up and I asked my father and I said, I'm reaching a brick wall and I got to feed these people. It's important for me to feed these people and I need help. And my father said, how much do you need? I asked him for $7,000 and he gave it to me. He said, it's a gift. I told him I would pay him back and I would make sure he got it with interest. And he laughed at me and 12%, 12% and he laughed at me. I said, it's an investment. This is an investment. So within a week, my money was better and I gave him the two checks, one for interest and one with uh, the capital. And my father cashed the checks, he made photocopies, and, and when he passed away, I actually had those uh, sent to me in Winnipeg. Wow, and he, and he had them on his wall, I think. Yes, he did, he was very proud of that. He would tell anyone that would listen that 
my son paid me he paid me seven thousand dollars and here's the interest incredible and and you were close to your brother as well uh after all he was in on the paper routes with you both of you were in on that together and i get the feeling you would have wanted this business to be about him and you absolutely but he died early my brother passed away unexpectedly from a blood clot from a surgery it was very uh it was very traumatic i didn't expect it my business was growing i was buying and acquisitioning uh, companies uh, the name was getting out there and we were growing very rapidly and everything reached a, a screeching halt when uh, he passed away unexpectedly and uh, my whole life changed forever from that. I lost my best friend. And I, I read in the research you, uh, you nearly gave up. You didn't want to get out of bed. You were that depressed. Very depressed. It's very hard. Very hard. And he had a daughter and you didn't know? No. I, uh, I, we found out. Um, it was in the obituary. And we uh, found out uh, the mother had reached out to me after reading I was passing. And uh, it was a very uh, difficult situation to address. My mother was very upset. Uh, myself, we lost my father uh, uh, it was 18 months earlier. And uh, I didn't know how to respond to that, but before we uh, we buried my brother, we did a DNA test, and uh, sure enough, it was uh, proven that uh, that was his daughter. And then how old was the child? She was 18 at the time. So you were able to, to help her out in life? Yes, I was. And, uh, and to get back to your entrepreneurial story, something very interesting I noticed, um, as you say, you were acquisitioning companies, but you weren't boastful uh, about it. Uh, you weren't trumpeting it. Quite the opposite. You were keeping it uh, discreet, and it reminded me of somebody, a real estate developer, buying up plots of land on the same block, but he does it unbeknownst to anybody until he's got the whole block. Um, it's sort of the way you, you, you prepared your company. Yes, I did. Uh, I would buy them, and what I would do is actually uh, kept them very uh, quiet, and uh, I would nurture them, get them uh, strategically in place. And then I would uh, I flipped the switch in uh, August of uh, 2005, and brought him under the impact banner. So nobody realized until you flipped that switch how big this would be. Impact was uh, a very uh, loud presence when we walked into the marketplace. And no one saw it coming. And now you have something like 3,000 employees. That is correct. And I would imagine that that is a, a management challenge on its own because this is a very sensitive business. After all, um, you, you handle corporate secrets. You have the keys to the place, literally. Uh, it must be 24-7 and somebody must always be calling you with some crisis. You know, and more often uh, I have a great team of management people, um, cultivated, a lot of respect. Um, I have amazing people that work with me in all my regions. Um, have personal relationships with them all on a friendly, uh, personal basis and a professional basis. And it's, um, it's an honor to work with these people, these managers and uh, the people in Winnipeg, the people in Regina, Saskatoon, Calgary, Edmonton, uh, across uh, the prairies, just amazing people. But how did you handle that um, when it was smaller? When it, when it really was put in your lap, a robbery, a fire, whatever, the crisis, um, when you weren't this big, uh, it had to come to you. What were the, the most dramatic moments, the toughest parts? The, I, I, never took the, I never took the assignment slightly. Anything that came to me, I always made sure I personally put my involvement in, a sense of urgency, and I always made sure that the client uh, felt safe and secure. I always made sure that the client was looked after. They came to me with uh, being a victim. They, uh, they needed someone they could trust, someone that would look after them. And I gave them that because I always took on the, the responsibility, whatever their problem was, became my problem. And I don't like problems, I fix problems. Now, you're, you're uh, cheek to jowl with the law enforcement. You, you're in, a, in a, an area that's very similar, but they have power of access, power of search, they can get into computers, they can do all kinds of things um, to get their job done. Are you sometimes um, called upon to act almost like the police? You know what, I, I get a lot of uh, unusual requests. Uh, we try to filter 
uh, the requests that make sense and uh, work with those and uh, anything that seems uh, unreasonable will definitely reject that. And do you prefer a big piece of business where you can manage it uh, and, and plan the management of it uh, in, in a very deliberate way? Or will you still take on uh, the small client, the mom and pop store? Everyone is a big client to me, whether they're smaller or large. I like dealing with people. I enjoy my relationships with people. I like taking people's problems and showing them solutions and working with them to craft a proper result on teamwork compassion and dedication. Hiring must be tough in, in, in this business because as you point out, you generally tend to hire from within. So people are trained in house. Um, but still, it seems to me you want to, you, you have to be careful. You want to weed out because your front line are security guards. You provide guards for all kinds of events and all kinds of, of, uh, of public occasions. Um, you, you must want to be very careful, weed out the guy with no judgment will whack somebody with a nightstick. I mean, that is that is a risk, isn't it? That is correct. And, you know, we usually have those issues like every other security company. But I actually employ uh, quality management control that uh, will take from the profits of the company and reinvest into those people that mirror the, uh, the mobile supervisors, uh, the daily supervisors, uh, and they go out there just do quickly... Uh, monitor the progress of the guards, investigators with the client and the, the staff. We get a full data report on everything on a daily basis and we could plug a report in anywhere across Canada. And I could see what's going on in the marketplace on a daily basis. And, and just how do you spot the bad apples? How do you weed them out? Well, there's a lot of simulation tests. Like we, we basically work with scenarios and sometimes we'll engineer a scenario where we'll test a person's integrity and we'll find what that person's all about at that point. So you mean like uh, uh, not leaving money on the table in plain sight, nothing so, so obvious and so simple, but little scenarios like that? Report writing an incident or break-in, um, you know, to, right down to a shoplifter, um, you know, to, a distress call. Um, it could be a different uh, scenario for any, for the different individual. And I guess if, if it's something like a rock concert, um, you, you, people have to have a, a range of talents. You want uh, people who are uh, big enough to, uh, to keep the crowd under control, uh, but they've got to be gentle giants, right? They cannot, uh, they cannot bully people either. That's what you're looking for. People skills are very important uh, for my belief at impact. I do not employ goons, um, and I will never employ people with that mentality, and if I do, uh, have those people in our play, they're quickly weeded out. And what you've done in your industry, it looks like anyway on paper that you've consolidated most of this industry in Western Canada. That, that's an enormous achievement. When that happens though in, in many industries, when they finally consolidate and the smaller brands uh, leave or go out of business or get acquired, you end up with a duopoly or a triopoly. Do you have a couple of major competitors out there? I have uh, a few competitors out there, um, but in my mind, we're not looking so much for um, the race for uh, the market share. We're looking for quality and changing the industry. And we have a vision of where we're going to be at, and we're going to change the industry with you know strategic guard placement, training, education, uh, appearance, uh, integrity, and morale. Now, I, I remember in the old days, people would make bad jokes about security guards, uh, unkind jokes. They'd say, oh, the guy has a grade 10 education. We wonder how he got that far. Um, have the standards gone up, though? Do, For instance, do you hire based on a minimum of a high school diploma or college education or something like that? You know what? I'd like to see uh, an equal opportunity. There are people that have dropped out for different reasons. I, I could totally relate with some of the scenarios um, at one time, I had dropped out of school as well as I was living uh, in a situation where I had to put roof uh, money uh, into my into my mouth to feed myself, and I couldn't uh, attend school. So I, and do both, and I had the luxury uh, with my parents, but with when they moved to Toronto, I had also had to drop out and do that as well. And I don't view people or shortchange them of an opportunity for a career based on uh, education. I, I believe in them with integrity what their passion, their work ethic, and uh, if they have the drive, I always like to promote within. 
to look now at something, um, uh, in a sense, more glamorous, something that fascinates people when they look at your industry. It's the body men, uh, the, the people who are not, they're not in law enforcement, uh, but they're hired to protect important people in, in political campaigns or whatever, and they're hired privately. Um, so so uh, they have a lot of the attributes of, of the Secret Service. You know, they've got the earpiece and, and, uh, and sometimes the, uh, the weapons permit and so on. And it looks like quite a fun job. Do you do some of that? Yes, we do. And uh, when we do those assignments, we always strategically place uh, the right personnel to take on those assignments because it's very crucial. For